Did I misunderstand? Actually, Lucifer was a special angel that was created for a special job. He was the highest of all the angels. I couldn't find, I thought it might be in Genesis. Fine, what, do you, what were you exactly looking for? Well, I was looking to see about any words that talked about, about the angel. You would have to go to Ezekiel and Isaiah. Now I can help you with that later on. Later on, but but seriously, uh, yeah. Well, no, no. It's 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 always it's always good to to uh, ask these questions and to 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 learn and to understand this. So I don't have a problem. And you can stay later after night after school today, and and I can help you through with some of these questions. Lorna can go home. I, I think your reputation is good enough, Denise. That, that <laughs> we'll go with that. <laughs> so no, that's good. But uh, yeah, no, and uh, you know, it, it's just it's so important to ask these questions so that we certainly do have an understanding of uh, what's uh, what's going on. So I want to thank each of you again for uh, coming out. It's always nice to have a few of you that um, we have always seem to have about six or seven come out for the afternoon class. I don't have Nanette with me tonight, so um, if somebody makes mistakes, you guys don't know it, but I'm standing up here and she's always uh, directing, so I don't. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's that's. That's exactly it. I will say that. It, it is surprising how much you, uh, and then when you're up here and you're, tr you're kind of thinking and, and trying to talk and, uh, yeah, and sometimes my mouth gets ahead of my brain. I hate to admit that, but, uh, <laughs> so anyway, it's good to have you all here. Let's just bow our heads and Lord, I want to thank you for the privilege we have of being here tonight. We're going to open your word. We're going to get a little understanding of uh, your goodness and your grace to each and every one of us. And as we study this, may it just uh, fill us with joy knowing that uh, the plan of salvation is in place. So I thank you for all that you've done today. Keep us safe. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Uh, Lorna had up there a picture. <laughs> that was good, Lorna. That was really... That was really, really good. Um, just because you may not have it, or you may have brought it, but, but whatever, we have it here. And uh, we'll just do a quick little review, a little bit of, of uh, going through this. And the reason we keep going through this is because if you're not familiar with this, uh, it can be overwhelming to see it once or twice and then try and figure everything out. And so this, these pictures kind of help us. In the afternoon class, we played a clip from, uh, from YouTube that really helped a lot of them understand it. But I'm not playing it tonight because then you get into all of this. Uh, uh, did you get permission to use it on if somebody wants to see it and everything else? I did, used one last week. And, and um, the lady at the back that's not here tonight informed me that uh, there's all these privacy things and everything. So... So we'll just, we'll just go with this tonight. Um, and, and so we went through the sanctuary, and we went through the particular articles of furniture, and each of them representing something. And if I just use this for just, a, and this is such a terrible drawing, um, but it's okay, we can, we can live with it. You have to. Um, but we know that there was, this was God, where he, he dwelt. And we know that there was a veil across here. And we had these seven pieces of furniture that we talked about. Seven pieces that would, would show us through the plan of salvation. And each and every one of those pieces of furniture represented an aspect of Jesus Christ. Every one of them represents Jesus Christ. Seven being the number of completeness and wholeness, wholeness and, and holiness. And we, we've learned that there was these different little gates and, and uh, curtains and stuff in here that Jesus said, I am the way, that's through here. 
I am the truth that was into here, and eventually the veil was removed, which is life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So that's a little bit of what, what we, we are seeing here. Tonight, we're just going to look at a very special, one special piece of furniture that was before the front of the veil, and it was the altar of incense. There's two altars, both containing fire. This one was on the outside, in which they burnt all kinds of animals that were the sacrifices, and this here altar in the middle was the altar of incense, and it's in your notes from last uh, week if you want to go through it. It was a very special little altar on which they burnt fra uh, frankincense each, every day. Twice a day, the high priest would come in and put frankincense on this here altar. And that's what we're going to uh, study a little bit tonight. Wanted to just uh, share with you as well that, that uh, when the veil was torn, the work was absolutely complete. Pleaded on the plan of salvation, Jesus says it is finished. And when he said it is finished, the, all of the outer court work had also been done, his work on earth. And we studied about his work on earth, being he was the sacrifice, the burnt offering, and he was also produced the, the, the Holy Spirit, which was the water. Remember we talked about last week, for those of you that were here, and if I go a little fast, I will, you can stop me, but um, I will answer a lot of questions afterwards. Um, not a problem being stopped. It's just that they can't hear you ask the questions, and I'll try and repeat them so that they, that they get them. But when we know that this represented where the blood of the Lamb was slain, and this here represented the Holy Spirit, the washing of water. Remember, this was a laver. Washing. Washing. We remember when Jesus' heart was pierced, out of his heart came blood and water. That's exactly what this is here. The blood justified us. The sanctify, uh, the labor, the water in the labor washed us, sanctified us, made us holy. We talked a little bit about that last week. Um, so once we have been justified and sanctified, we can now come into the presence of God. That will happen when our body is glorified. So we see the justified, the sanctified, and the glorified. Those are the three aspects that we, we are. Once we are, we can come into the presence of God once we come with a glorified body. Up until then, because we're justified and sanctified, we can still come to him in prayer. We come directly to him in prayer. We don't go through the priest anymore. That, was, that part of it was done away with. And so we see when, when Jesus says, it is finished, this literally is taken away because his work here was done and we know that he returned to, to heaven. That's so why we, we read, Paul tells us in Hebrews, no more uh, sacrifice. No more. There was no sacrifice ever made in heaven. The sacrifice was made here down on earth. There is no death in heaven. And so he came to this earth, did, did the work that he had to do. We talked about that in his white linen clothes, uh, the blood-stained clothes and everything. We went through that whole system. And then we know that this was erased and this was erased as well. And because Paul tells us you have been justified and sanctified, you now have become a royal priesthood. You guys are following with me here? A royal priesthood. The priesthood were priests were allowed to come into this section only. But the veil has been erased. It's just one room now. And now we can come boldly to where the throne of God is, where we see the mercy seat and the... It's not overly complicated. The pieces of furniture are, are, are there. We see that they were in the shape of a cross. And we will see that this here is actually what heaven looked like, right here. 
until Satan came, Lucifer, and iniquity was found in him. And because there was iniquity found in him, there was a veil put up. Because you cannot be in the presence, a sinful created being cannot be in the presence of, of a holy God because he will be consumed by the holiness of God. Not because of God's anger, not because he's ticked off, which often is made the case, but just because his holiness will consume you. When we get to the end of the book of Revelation, we will see that all are in this all-consuming fire and the holiness of God. They will literally be in, in a fire because God's holiness will destroy them. So this is, this is how the sanctuary was, was set up. Now you would come and you would bring sacrifices and you could bring a sacrifice. We don't have it here right now, but you'll still see it up here where Lorna has the, the picture up here. You would be a, bring a sacrifice of a lamb and you would, or, or whatever animal you were to bring and you would bring that sacrifice to the altar. They would tie, usually a lamb, up beside the altar. They would slit its throat. You had to do that. It was your responsibility to do it because you had caused the sin. Now, you brought that there not to appease God and say, look, I have brought a sacrifice for you, but rather the opposite. It was to say, God, you promised that you would give a sacrifice that would take away my sins. We often teach the other way around and think that we're, we worked hard to bring a sacrifice. No, we sinned, and we our sacrifice is of no value. But I bring in a lamb because you promised that one day you would send a lamb that would take away my sins. Really important point. Really important point. You promised. That's why when John the Baptist is out baptizing, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He was announcing the promise that God made is here. This is him. He has come. And he will go through this sanctuary service, and he will pay the, the penalty for our sins, he will take away our guilt for our sins, and his blood will cleanse us, and we can once again be in communion and in fellowship with, with uh, God. Once again, just a quick little review. Why do we take communion? Because we remember that the Lamb of God, his body died for me, and his blood cleanses me. That's why we take communion. They had this, these symbolisms, remembering that God, not remembering, looking forward and anticipating when God would come and do that. We take these two emblems, remembering what Jesus Christ came and did for us. So that's what, what the whole sanctuary service was set up to, for us to, uh, to understand. Now, it is a little more complicated than just that. And we're going to look at one of those little complications this evening. And this is, this is really vital and, and be very, very important. As we get to prayers of confession, if I lived 110 miles away, how would I get there every day to offer a sacrifice because I have a sin problem every day? Now, you think about this. This would be really interesting when they lived out in the wilderness in the camp and everybody was able to uh, come to the temple. They were all within walking dis distance. And can you just imagine every day Dale bringing a lamb and everybody going, I wonder what he did today. I mean, there would be just a parade going to the temple. You can imagine, you know, there might have been a little gossip <laughs> <laughs> going around, who went by the house today, did you see? You know what I'm, this was really an issue. Here's how God solved a lot of that problem. Out on this burnt altar, every morning and every evening, a lamb for the nation was put on there by the priest. Okay? So you didn't have to always bring a lamb as such because the lamb was there. 
It was, it, it, it was provided by God through, through um, a lot of it was through the priests who looked after these animals, took care of them, but they would be selected one in the morning, one in the evening. And the, those lambs were on, burned on that fire. That fire was never to go out, and that lamb was burnt there because sin is 24-7. They, you can come, we understand way better today when we're living in a world and we know the circle and, and the time zones and everything else. There has to be constant forgiveness of sins. And so the priests would come and they would do that every morning and every evening. They also would come and light the candle morning and night and they would also put incense on this little altar here. Now we're going to say this is getting really complicated, Dale. It really wasn't that complicated. Another thing that was kind of amazing is lots in, in, in much of the early system, you had to be a certain age to get there. Uh, the blind, lame were not allowed into the temple. Uh, women were not in, allowed in there. How would they get forgiveness? It will be through the prayers of confession. Now. In some cases, we also, the Jewish people also believe that it would be through the prayers of their, of their patriarch or their husband. Um, but from what, from what I've gathered and garnished, it, it, it will be, you could come to God always through prayer after the temple was built in Jerusalem. Up until that time, it was, it was different. The, and, and it's hard for us to understand or believe that often these, these, um, the temple would be left and they'd forget about it for years on end. And we know that from the different stories where they would, I think it was Josiah decided to uh, rebuild the temple and they found the books and they couldn't believe that they had, <laughs> they started Passover again. David, I think, was... Uh, when he found the temple, it had been in Shiloh for almost 20 years or whatever. So this, as much as we think this system was always there, this was the problem with the Jewish people. They often forgot the temple and the sanctuary service, and especially when it was in a tent form. So we'll see why David now wants to build, build a permanent, permanent uh, temple. So... Just to help us understand here then, when we, we're going to talk tonight about prayers of confession. Because this is, is so important that there, they could pray to God asking confession, and those, those uh, confessions would then be mixed with this sweet-smelling fragrance of frankincense and go up, mingled together, and go up. Frankincense always... Uh, represented the righteous acts of Christ, what Christ had done for us. So literally what's going to be here is when I ask for a prayer of confession, this frankincense in that temple would have represented what Christ is going to do for us in the future. We now look back and say it's what he has done for us, but it was what he would do for us in the future. It would be because of what he did mingled with our prayers of confession, it would create a smoke that would go up over the veil into the presence of God and could be forgiven. That's what we're dealing with tonight. Now, here's one of the little interesting things that is, will help us to understand the story of David and Bathsheba, because that's where we're going with this. And that is, there were certain sins in the temple that you could not offer an animal sacrifice for. They were considered the big ones. I know. And basically would be the Ten Commandments as well as a few other ones that would be added to this. And there was absolutely no sacrifice. You could not come here and confess on an animal. You had to come directly to God for forgiveness because you had broken His law. You had fallen out of covenant. You were in covenant with God, 
when, at, when he gave the commandments. Oh yes, Lord, we will do all that you say. That's what they said. We will do all that you said. And then they said to Moses, now you get up on the mountain. We don't want to hear no more from him. We're scared spitless. You can read this in Exodus. It'll help you when you, when you under, go through this to understand. And so Moses goes back up on the mountain because they broke the, the Ten Commandments, takes another set of tablets, which the Lord does, uh, writes on them as well. But he gives a whole other list of commandments called the ceremonial laws. And those are Moses' laws. So if you want to know the difference between God's law and the Moses' law, we will see that Moses' law will be done, will be fully fulfilled. That's what it means when he says, I will fulfill each, I've fulfilled the law and the prophets. He fulfilled Moses' law, which was all about the ceremony, this way in which we would get forgiveness. Why this is going to be so important tonight is because you and I are in this very state right now, and when we sin, we can come to God through prayer and receive forgiveness of sins. That's why this is, this is why this is so important to understand the sanctuary and the way through the sanctuary. Now, I did write this down, and you will be able to, uh, to look at that. Uh, basic, here's the basic premise of it. There were certain laws that if you broke, you were to be taken to the outskirts of the city and stoned. Well, this is pretty tough. We're talking cruel, tough stuff. That was the rules of uh, uh, what, what were in there, in, in, in the Bible. So if you sinned certain sins, mostly the breaking of the commandments, you were condemned to be taken to the outskirts and stoned. However, you could come to God through confession of prayer. Now, there was times when, when they did this, not very often. You will remember with the woman caught in adultery, the law of Moses says that we are to stone her. What do you say? And then Jesus quoted another verse where he said, it can only be done on, on, uh, in order to stone somebody, you have to have at least two or three witnesses. Because that's also Moses' law. Otherwise, I could just come and you, who, we could just, we could have a, you know, had to have witnesses. Now you understand then why Jesus started to write in the sand the sins of those people who should have been stoned. One by one they left and he was the only one left. He asked, where are your accusers? There has to be more than one in order to fulfill the law of Moses. And they had all left. So, because some people say, well, he should have done that. Because, yeah, but you have to know all the laws. There's all these little rules when you read through Leviticus, that book that's so exciting when you read it. Uh, <laughs> all these little rules are in there. And, and uh, that one's in Deuteronomy. I put it down there so that you would, you would understand it. Now, they were to be taken to the outskirts and stoned. Can you figure out why stoning? Because with stoning, there was no shedding of blood. Shedding of blood is for the remission of sins. Jesus Christ, however, will be taken to the outskirts of Jerusalem, and he will be put to death through crucifixion, and his blood will be shed for these very sins that required you to die on the outskirts of the, of the city. It's, it's a, it's a, it was quite a system. So this is, this is what we're, 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 we're talking about tonight. We're going to look at, 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 at the story of David and Bathsheba, in which David is going to commit some sins, where he is supposedly supposed to be taken to the outskirts and stoned. Now this is, this is really um, hard, <laughs> hard-nosed stuff. I'm not making... But, but it's still applying, these things are still applying today with the Jewish people, as much as we think that they wouldn't. Let me give you an example. During, from 1939 to 1945, over six million Jews 
were put to death, innocent people put to death in World War II. We know that. In 1948, the UN government took and uh, chased the Palestinian people out of their land that they had been there for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and made a new state for Israel. Okay? The people in Israel to this day, many of your orthodox and, and, and different ones, say we got our land back because six million innocent people paid the price for God, to God, an atonement to God. This is what they actually believe. And we got it back because innocent people shed their blood. And they, they will go back. It's interesting to listen to them, to, to the story of Isaac where Isaac was willing to shed his blood. He didn't, but was willing to shed his blood. So an innocent one, the death of an innocent one, can make atonement for us as a nation. If they would accept what Jesus Christ did for them, they would know the innocent one did make atonement for them. I'm just helping you to see how it's still affecting things in our, in our society today. It is interesting now, that it has to be the shedding of blood. And almost all of the Jewish people were gassed. And so there was no shedding. Like, I'm just, like, this, is, this, this all plays into the actual things that are happening today. They gave up their lives. Yes, they did. But they did not, there was some shot. There was, I'm not going to argue with, with people over that. Absolutely did not volunteer. No, no. No, they didn't volunteer. But often this would happen back in the Old Testament where, where there would be a number of deaths and it would make an atonement for. One of the key examples would be um, uh, after the, David had a census in which he count, called the people, accounted the, the army, and he wasn't supposed to, and 70,000 people died and eventually it was believed that they made the atonement. This is a part of the Jewish belief system. I just share that with you, and I shouldn't have maybe took you off on that little rabbit trail. But I just, I just show you how, how this is still playing out in, in our society today. Uh, sin causes destruction. That's exactly what this is. And it caused from the very beginning to the, to the very end. And even though, even though we receive the forgiveness of sin, the consequences of sin still remain. That's so hard for sometimes for, for people to understand. Well, if I've been forgiven, why? Well, the consequences of sin are still the same. I talked to a young lady here a while back that had been uh, raped in a, in, in a very serious situation. And it was a, 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 a man of a, a different ethnic, so let's just say that, and a pregnancy involved from that. And her family had a hard time with this. And I mean, you live with this, this child out of wedlock, out of, and you, you pay, the, you pay the, the price of something that you... The consequences of sin are still there, even though she was an innocent one. All we have to do is think of, about the perspective of Joseph with Mary. You can only imagine the rumors and, and the rest of his life he had to live with this, with this uh, idea that he had not... He had, and Mary had been sleeping around, or, or he had to live with even a greater cause knowing that she, she was pregnant and he wasn't the one. Like, I mean, I'm just I'm putting all this just so that we understand the consequences of sin, the consequences of somebody making a, a certain mistake, and many people pay for the rest of their life. It may be because of your sin. It may be because of somebody else's sin. It, sin is evil, and there's consequences. So even though forgiveness comes, there are consequences. And we're going to study a list, a little bit of that here tonight. And I want to take you into the story of David and Bathsheba. 
Most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with this story of where David takes another man's wife, happens to think she's kind of pretty out there as she's bathing in the moonlight and uh, being the king, um, decides that this would be a wonderful opportunity, and he, 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 we don't know what her part or role was in this. What we do know was she got pregnant, so then he calls the husband back from the army, tries to get him to go home. He refuses because he's a loyal soldier. And through it all, um, we have a major problem. And David eventually gives the orders to send him to the front of the battle, and he is dead. So we see adultery being here, and we see murder being here. Two sins that require stoning, death, and especially for the king especially for the king. So we got a major problem on our hands. And so um, we know that Nathan the prophet comes in and he confronts David. He tells the little story about there was one man who had one ewe and there was a man who had four ewes and the man with the four ewes stole the, 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 the one ewe from the, from the poor guy and David is angry and, and willing to just, we're going to have... This guy will pay. And Nathan says, it is you. You are the one. And David knew he had been exposed, and he knew that David, or, or Nathan, knew exactly what he was. Now David has a decision. What is that decision going to be? He can confess, or he can deny. And we've found here through always, through, this, through our studies here, that if you confess to God, he is faithful to forgive your sins. This is what makes David so special. He knew and understood God in that way. And so, yes, this is, good job, Lorna. As you guys, were, she's, she's on the ball. So good. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. This was good news for David. Because he knew if he was exposed. And if we go to verse 14, uh, How be it, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Okay? Are there consequences to sin? Yes. Who were the two guilty parties in this? David and Bathsheba. Who was the innocent one that died? Her husband was one. But here we see the baby. What would be the baby's name? Wasn't given a name. It's called the son of David. And so the son of David will be the one who pays the price. The innocent one who pays the price. We know that Jesus Christ referred to himself as the son of David. It's just little interesting parallels as we go go through this story. I find it so amazing. But here is David understanding that he will now be forgiven. And so we are going to read, and I'm going to get uh, Lorna to bring up uh, Psalms 50, 51. This is the great prayer of confession. And you have it in your in your book here, but when she brings it up, we'll be able to read these verses, and then we will go to the comments I wrote there for you, just so that we get a bit of an understanding of exactly what is happening here with David, okay? So here we go. Have mercy on me, O Lord, according to thy loving kindness. David is literally pleading for mercy and for God's kindness. This is the only way that he will get out of this predicament and situation that he is in. He recognizes who it will be that will give him this, this loving kindness, this mercy. According unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. We literally want you to take away my sin, Lord. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Now, if I still had the 
up here, we would see that to take away took a sacrifice, but to wash me, make me clean again. This is, and that's okay, Lorna, that's okay. You just, you stick on Psalm, on Psalm 51. That's, I got her, she's so good at this. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. My sin will condemn me and I will forever be, be condemned to a death penalty unless you do something for me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in the sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. And so when we read those comments on, on that, the next page, you will see them there so that you will um, understand them. A little bit, David acknowledges his sins. Whenever we break one of God's commandments, we have sinned against him because we broke his covenant. That's what David is saying. I, yes, he sinned against Bathsheba and Uriah. I have. But I have broken your commandments, and your commandments demand that I should die. Unless by the mercy somehow you can find it in your heart to forgive me and to to blot out my sins. There was no animal sacrifice that could pay the penalty for these sins in the sanctuary service. Death for the sinner was demanded, and that was a penalty only Christ could pay, and this is why he died on the outskirts of the camp for these sins. Okay? We now read verses 5 and 6. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. This is an interesting verse because uh, it's one of the reasons that, and, and I don't know where you all stand on, on, on the whole question of original sin. Are we born sinful? Or are we sinful when, when we sin? This is an important question. It's an important question. And I'll give you the right answer, and if you want to argue with me, no. <laughs> no, um, this is really important because after, after Adam and Eve had sinned, everybody after that was born in sin. Uh, for those of you who wonder, I don't know, you look back at uh, most, I know some of you have had children, and uh, at the age of two, you suddenly decide your child, you find your child is quite selfish. Did you teach that child to be selfish? Did you spend hours and hours teaching it to be selfish? Or was it on its own, new and learned? The whole world is born this way. This is what David is saying. We are born with a sinful nature, and we literally need a Savior. Um, it, it, you know, trying to explain this to some people is, 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 is hard. And I'm not, we can debate this afterwards because I don't want to get hog, bogged down on this. But the whole point that we have babies that are still born and died. Why? If there was no sin in them, they would not have died because, like, we just see all of these, these, these things. The bottom line, from what I understand and the way I I see it, and, and I'm not always right. Uh, Nanette, would be, if she's not here tonight, but she could vouch for, <laughs> for that. But it's just basically we're all born with a sinful nature. Greed comes, uh, it doesn't matter what it is. We are born with this nature. Um, we are born without the Spirit of God. It's why we need the Spirit of God again to be born in us. I won't go too much more into that, but, but that's basically what David is saying. We're all born. because, And the reason we are, um, that's what happened to us. But now each and every one of us has a choice to make. Will we receive this Savior and this free gift? This is now the choice. God has always been a God of love and a God of choice. Now he gives us the choice. You are all in trouble, and, and, and I could find you Bible verses that would, 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 would show us that. You've all sinned, all fallen short 
So what it says, but I have given you a free plan here, and you get to make the choice of whether you want to receive it or not. Right. Yes. Right. Totally precious to the Lord. So precious that I'm willing to give my son to pay this price and give you the choice of whether you want to accept the gift or not. I, I, bottom line is, here, here's, here's, here's part of the proof for me, and I shouldn't have, shouldn't dwell, have dealt, well, dwelt on this quite so long, but God had a huge problem with... Um, in other pagan nations, they were offering newborn babies to be burnt in the fire of their, of their God. And it was always based on the fact that I am giving you an innocent baby. Somebody who hasn't, with no sin. And, and God had such a problem with that because there's only one who will come that is without sin. And it was because he was born of the Spirit. Right? You remember? He was born incarnate from the Holy Spirit. Okay? And so we too then must be born again of the Spirit. It's why all this fills in. That's for anybody that's just, I spend a little time on that just because a lot of people have a hard time with that. Until I ask them if you ever had children, and they say, yeah. And I said, did you teach them to be selfish? And did you teach them to to fight with other kids and did you well no no it came it comes from within it really does so that at least that's my take on it um so that's what we're we're, we're, we're talking about here now we're going to go to verses seven through oh verse six just for a minute behold thou desirest truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know the wisdom. A little bit more of why David is saying, you know, <laughs> in my inward parts needs to be cleansed. My heart needs to be cleansed. Everything about me needs to be cleansed. And so now we come to verse 7. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me. This is, this is all sanctuary talk, right? Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. David talked about in another place how his bones creaked and groaned because he couldn't be back in the presence of God. He wouldn't confess his sin, and he couldn't come into the presence of God knowing he was a sinner, and he, I, I don't know if he hoped that eventually the whole problem would blow over, which is a real strange thing to think about God letting things blow over. But, but this is what David is, is talking about. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. He's literally pleading, I need a new spirit. Create in me a clean heart, because my heart has been unclean. And this is all the sanctuary talk he is talking about. I need you to blot out my sins, which God had promised him that he would through the sanctuary service back in the book of Exodus. But David here is now pleading with God, renew a right spirit within me. Verse 11, cast me not away from thy presence and take not the Holy Spirit from me. David was anointed at a very young age to be the king. The Spirit of God anointed, anointed him. That's literally the oil represents the Holy Spirit, was poured on him, and he had the Spirit. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. This was huge to David. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Why? Because the earlier king before him was King Saul. And King Saul, if we went through the history, the Holy Spirit had been taken from him, and this 
kingdom was stripped from him because of it. And he went on to do all kinds of things, including committing suicide, actually, uh, at, at the end. So he's literally saying, don't take that Holy Spirit from me. I know what happened to Saul. I've seen this. Lord, I know what I need. I need your Holy Spirit in order to create this clean heart. We would have been back here talking about the washing again with the Holy Spirit. Wash me and give me this clean heart. He's literally confessing to God. Literally confessing to God. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Not my salvation here. Restore to me the salvation that you give me. Thy salvation. And uphold me with thy free spirit. What was it going to cost David? Nothing. The Holy Spirit is a free gift from God. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. And God, because you have done this, when you have done this, verse 13 and 14, I love this. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. This is so important. Because you have done this for me and you've shown me how you will do it, I want to teach transgressors and sinners everywhere how they can be converted. Do you know what David would then go and do? He would build, go to build the sanctuary. This is what he's talking about. Let me build you a home, a house, a sanctuary where I can, this plan of salvation that we've been talking about I will be able to show all those who come here, all nations, all sinners, how they too can receive forgiveness and mercy from this God. This is literally what he's saying. Then I will, will teach transgressors. Deliver me from blood guiltiness. That is death. That's what that is, the guilt. The blood guiltiness is literally, I was supposed to die. I was supposed to die. Deliver me from that, oh God. Please. He's literally laying his heart out to God. I know that I was supposed to die, but you have delivered me from that guilt. Now, if we were to go back to the Day of Atonement fairly quickly, we will remember that there was two goats and two offerings. One was the blood that cleansed us, and the other goat was the guilt offering. It's what it's called, literally, in Isaiah. Because he paid the penalty, my death penalty, took it away. Remember? The second goat, we had the two goats, that's why we have the two offerings of, of, of the blood and the body. Literally, that second goat took away my guilt. Are there still consequences to sin? We've discussed that. Of course there is. But will I still have the death penalty over me? No, you will take that away. And when you do, O oh God, the God, now he says, of my salvation, the God of my salvation, I received my salvation from thy salvation. And my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O oh Lord, Open thou my lips, and my mouth shall shew forth thy praise. Do you know who wrote the most songs of praise in the... David. All the Psalms. These are, these are praises of salvation. They're praises of God's righteousness. They're, he wrote most, a, a lot of them. He would have wrote, I don't know, some people say as high as 70%, but whether he... Whatever. I will sing these songs so that others will know. I will build the sanctuary so that you know. I will do all of these things, Lord, because of what you have shown me and granted me this mercy. I will do this. And David literally set out to build a new temple, the most glorious temple, Solomon's temple, we call it. He will build that in Jerusalem. 
And so we, we literally see this uh, here. Do you think that uh, God really did forgive him of his sins? Okay, I got this verse down here, and I want you to read it. I could have got you to open your Bibles, but, but uh, the proof of David's salvation is found in 1 uh, Kings 14.8. And I'm just going to show you. I'll see how fast Lorna is. I, I didn't even ask her, and this one's being called out of place. But, but I want you to see this. This is the case of where one of the kings... Israel has been divided into two parts, and the one king is about to lose his kingdom, so he gets his wife to dress up and go talk to a prophet to see what the end results will be, and when she comes in, he recognizes her and, dis and, and whatever. And I want you to read 14.8. Yes, sorry, Lorna. 14.8, 1 Kings 14.8. Okay. And here's what the prophet says. This is many years after David. And I rent the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it thee. And yet thou hast not been as my servant David, who kept my commandments, who followed me with all his heart to do that only which was right in mine eyes. This is after the Bathsheba story. Were his sins blotted out? Did God put them in the sea to remember them no more? Were they cast away from him? This is so important in this whole story of David. And do as David who did, who did only what was right in mine eyes. I hope that when you and I stand in front of the, <laughs> the good Lord, who only did what was right in mine eyes. Why? Because your sins have been blotted out and forgiven. You can only understand why David then wants to build this holy temple in Jerusalem so that everybody can come and see this God of mercy, this God who forgives. I was forgiven. I was... The whole Day of Atonement... That's what we talk about. We're getting back to the Day of Atonement again because this is all a part of it. When you stand before, before God, He's going to say, did you confess your sins? Yes, I confessed all my sins. I needed the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. And you promised you would take my sins and you would place them on a scapegoat, another goat, and He would bear all my sins and I would receive a pardon as if I'd never sinned. This is Day of Atonement. These are the proof in the Bible, these stories, some of them written four or five hundred years later, and we're seeing the connections that you, your sins are forgiven. It is a literal promise that I will blot them out as far as the east is from the west. It is the good news of the plan of salvation. You can <clears throat> only imagine how happy David had to have been he started collecting all kinds of gold and silver and you name it to build this temple. This was going to be God's house. And he was going to, he would set up all kinds of, uh, of uh, in some places there was thousands of singers to sing these praises. There was thousands of these people to do this and that. He wanted everybody to come to Jerusalem and they did come to Jerusalem to see the mercy and the wonder things that this God was willing to do. And yet when they drifted away, God says, I will also destroy this temple. Today they're trying to, trying to still build a new temple. That's a big issue in, in Israel right now because they have not accepted that Jesus Christ was that innocent one who came and bared their sins. And you're going to hear a lot about it in the next little while. It's getting more and more from red heifers having to be found to you name it. If you, it's amazing what they're doing. They're in place. The Levites, uh, the priests have been checked for perfect uh, uh, lineage because they have to be only from the tribe of Levi and they can't be mixed with other tribes and the whole. They've got it. I mean, it's a science. And the, the, it's what's happening 
as, 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 we, as we speak. So this is just a, a little bit of a, a, a bit of a history uh, to help us understand that David was so thrilled. Now David wanted to build that temple. And then Nathan said, you can't because you have shed so much blood in your time. You've been a warrior, literally a warrior. But I want Solomon, your son, to build it. And it is actually kind of a representation of God literally saying, I have, through the ages, with the flood, with this, with that, I've destroyed so much love, uh, so much uh, uh, life and blood. I want my son to build it. My son. And Solomon didn't go to war. There was no more. David had, had pursued everything that needed to be pursued. But what I love about the story of David is, Lord, you've given me my salvation. You won't let me build the temple. But I will do everything. I will pay for everything. I will, not because I want to be saved, but because I have been saved. This is literally him saying, this is, this is me just giving a, the great, a, a small token of a gift back to you for the great gift that you gave me. And so we see this is, is all about confession. It is the story of you and me coming before God with our prayers mixed with his righteousness and our prayers, we too being forgiven. It's the great news of the gospel. It really, really is. We then see, For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Look, look, Lord, if you would have wanted sacrifices, I'm the king. I could have given you a thousand bulls. I could have given you, like, sacrifices isn't a big costly issue to me. It's not what you're asking for. You're asking for a change of heart from me. To take away my pride, to know that I have sinned, to know the cost that it will cost you one day. That's what gives us a contrite heart. Lucifer, and if we, we'll, talk, we'll talk maybe about that after we close here. Lucifer was all about pride. He wanted to be like God. That's what it says in Ezekiel, Isaiah. He wanted to be the brightest of all the stars. And it was pride that brought in uh, iniquity into the world, the sin problem. David is saying, I know what you want. You want a broken heart. You want a contrite heart. You want somebody who loves you. And that's where Lucifer went a different direction because of, because of his pride. David acknowledges no sacrifice for those sins. And then he says, Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. He's talking about Jerusalem is now your holy city. Then thou shalt be pleased with the sacrifice of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then they shall offer bullocks upon thy altar. And that was the, the burnt offering at the very end there was always interesting because the burnt offering on the Day of Atonement was the last offering of the day. And it was a voluntary offering of atonement in which you brought the offering saying, God, I'm bringing this offering to show my gratitude for what you've done. The last offering, your sins had been taken away, and now there's this burnt offering of gratitude. It was voluntary. Each and every one of us gets to make that decision. Paul talks about us being a living sacrifice. You'll see that in your notes, and we're going fairly fast now because I know time is against us. But you will notice that, that a living sacrifice. I was a dying sacrifice for you, but I'm asking you to live for me. And that's what we're, we're talking about here. We'll just read this last couple of paragraphs here. Um, 
the prayers of confession. These prayers would go directly into the altar of incense where they would be mixed with the sweet smell of the burning incense. These prayers would mingle with the smoke that would ascend over the veil into the presence of God. And there's some verses in Revelation and in Psalms that will help you to know and understand that's what was happening. God went then through his grace and the promised sacrifice of his son, forgive these prayers of confession. It was the work of the high priest to keep the fire on the altar of incense always burning to indicate that God was willing to forgive 24-7, 365 days of the year. And you will find that in Exodus 30, 7 to 9. There was always a morning sacrifice and evening sacrifice of a lamb on the altar of burnt offering. This was a corporate offering for all the people who lived a distance away from the temple and confessed their sins through prayers. Today, our prayers of confession can go directly to God because the veil was torn open when the penalty for our sins was paid. Our prayers of confession, mixed with the sacrifice of Christ produced the sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, that's found in Ephesians 5, 2, for God to forgive our sins, to blot them out and remember them no more. We see, receive his righteousness when he takes away our sins. Very important. Every time you brought a sacrifice to the temple or said a prayer of confession, you were confessing your sin, recognizing you needed someone to pay the penalty for that sin. It would be God that would provide that lamb that takes away the sins of the people. So this gives us a quick understanding. I know we're already over an hour here, and uh, I know some of you are getting tired and uh, we're going we're gonna to kind of come to a close with this. If, if anybody wants to stay afterwards and ask questions, that's good. We will know and understand that just some of these uh, illustrations down below, these were the prophets and the, and the people who would continue to confess their sins even after the temple was destroyed. Daniel prayed three times a day. He ended up in the lion's den, but he would pray faithfully three times a day facing Jerusalem. They knew that he would. He was praying for his nation. You can go back and read some of his prayers. You can read some of the prayers of Elijah. There would be different ones. God accepts prayers of confession. It's really, really vital, really important for, for, for us. And, and because of this whole system today, and this is in our closing, we too offer up our prayers. And you, that frankincense, the sweet-smelling aroma of frankincense was constantly burning in there. You can only imagine being out in that desert, hot as it was, and the blood keep going into there, what it would have smelled like. In, the, in, in that tent. But there was a sweet-smelling aroma of what Christ would do. His righteous acts would be what produced the sweet-smelling aroma. I know it's a lot, and we've covered a lot of stuff in a very short period. <laughs> and I, I know you have the notes there, and... Um, and hopefully we know and understand. Bottom line, here it is, 101. Uh, altar of incense for dummies. <laughs> Took me a long time. I was so dumb at this. I trust me. That's why I say it jokingly. Bottom line, Jesus is willing to forgive me if I ask for forgiveness. And it's so strange, we, we teach our children in, when they're this high and this high that, you know, Jesus paid the price, and we go through all of this, the, the, and they have this truth down to a T. And then we get a little bit older, and we start mixing our own ideas in here, and we start this, and we start that. And pretty soon, we're all sitting here at the age of 50-plus going, I don't know why. But you ask your children... It's the same thing if you can't get your computer to run. It's got to be a four- or five-year-old in the house somewhere that can get it to go. And it's exactly the same thing in most cases where, where our children have been taught. We teach them just these simple, basic concepts. And then somehow we start to think. And we start to wonder. We start to check. And we start to... And that's why we keep coming back to this book 
That's why we, I used and chose this example tonight. I just want you to know beyond a shadow of a doubt, your sins are blotted out as far as the east is from the west, and eternal life can be yours. It's the good news of the gospel. Let's bow our heads. Lord, thank you for this good news. Help each and every one of us to accept it. Help each and every one of us to keep it simple. Help each and every one continue to read and study. And as we look through this book, may these concepts be shown through, the, through, through all of this book. Because this is the simple fact that we needed a Savior, and you provided one. The Lamb that takes away the sins of the world. It is the good news. We look forward to spending eternity with you one day. Until that day, wash us, cleanse us, give us a new heart, create in us this desire to serve you. May the good works that we do be because we understand what you did for us. Not because we earned it, because we will inherit it, but that we can just enjoy the assurance of our salvation that we find here in the Old Testament. We ask this in Jesus' precious name.